Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the esteemed FaceTime with Leaders, an initiative by World Development Corporation. I'm Sunny Pancholi, anchor at World Development Corporation. FaceTime with Leaders is a platform for industry titans to share their experiences, thoughts, ideas, and best practices in order to inspire one another and future leaders. In a nutshell, we attempt to encapsulate the multi-decadal learnings acquired by these industry leaders. We also hope that by conducting these FaceTime with Leaders interviews, we can bring together a global community of eminent personalities. By bringing together such visionaries on one platform, we hope to play a part in inspiring the lives of other leaders. Great learnings from great leaders undoubtedly assist everyone by identifying, nurturing, and using the trade secrets that are proven success formulas for many. And this is what we aim for with these sessions, by making them a gathering of industry stalwarts and a knowledge sharing community. We have one such corporate giant on FaceTime with leaders with us today, Mr. Sujit Kumar Pai. With an illustrious career spanning nearly three decades, he has left an indelible mark across diverse industry landscapes from process control, including oil and gas, metals, nuclear power, food and pharma, to automation and chemicals and gases, showcasing his versatility and expertise. He is a metallurgical engineer with a postgraduate in management specializing in marketing. He is a transformational leader and a certified business coach with a proven track record of spearheading business transformations and achieving exceptional results and significant achievements in generating substantial revenue and profit growth across a spectrum of industries by delivering innovative business solutions. His journey includes tenures at prestigious organizations such as Hindalco, LNT, that is Larson and Tupro, Emerson and Lind PLC. In his most recent role as the managing director at Lind PLC, Bangladesh, he has adeptly led a team of more than 300 employees, surpassing both financial and non financial targets. He has shouldered the responsibility of managing revenues, PL, safety and quality, fostering DNI, that is diversity and inclusion, regulatory compliance and customer service KPIs, and always prioritizing shareholders' interests. His leadership roles extend beyond national borders. Not only was he an integral part of the country leadership team at Lin, but he also held coveted positions in the India Junior Board and Asian leadership team at Emerson. Owing to his exceptional leadership edge, Mr. Pai has received numerous accolades and recognitions. Welcome to FaceTime with Leaders, Mr. Pai. Good afternoon to you, Sunny. It's a real pleasure to be here on this platform. And uh, I will say that at the outset, uh, a very happy new year to you and all of our wonderful audience who is getting hooked on this time. Thank you. Happy new year to you too, sir. So to begin with, our viewers would like to know in brief about your career journey so far. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sunny. And uh, to just share you something about my career, it's, uh, as you mentioned, you know, thanks for the wonderful introduction that you've actually given. And uh, it's been a three decade, uh, you know, my journey, which has been there. I'm a metallurgical engineer from VNIT Nagpur, that is uh, Vishweshwara National Institute of Technology Nagpur. And straight from the campus, I had got recruited into Hindalco. And that was my baptism of fire, uh, where, you know, I was getting introduced to uh, a new concept of aluminum selling, which is the continuous casting route, because aluminum is uh, manufactured through two routes. One is actually the way of the ingots and then hot rolled and cold rolled. The other one is actually to the continuous casting. It's a new thing. So it was a concept selling for us. We were, uh, I was posted in Hyderabad, then Nagpur, and then finally in Mumbai. And uh, it has been a very uh, good journey. That was my first uh, stint. And uh, from there, I moved on to Larsen and Tubro. And uh, with LNT was more of an institution. I can say that almost, uh, you know, worked over there for seven years plus. And during this time, I can say that uh, there was a lot of exposure to the projects uh, marketing, oil and gas, chemicals, offshore, and then nuclear has been my core area in which I actually contributed. Uh, if you know that there was a 1998 Operation Shakti, which is a Pokhran blast. So subsequently, there was a lot of uh, embargo, which was actually happening on to the uh, nuclear power circuit. And then I was involved in very uh, supplying those critical valves for the nuclear industry through LNT. 
So that has been there. There was a lot of accolades I got through the uh, segment, uh, highest order booking, very good performing employee. So the journey has actually been there. And then uh, it also enabled me to explore new markets of Chhattisgarh, Goa, Maharashtra into the dealer segment. So that's been my journey with LNT. And then subsequently, I uh, joined into Emerson. Uh, that was in 2003. And uh, with Emerson, it was more of a regional sales role. And then taking it gradually up to the director sales and marketing till 2013, which was a, I was uh, involved into a complete uh, manning, managing the team. And uh, again, it was been a growth. And uh, from Emerson, it has been into Linde, which has been my most recent uh, assignment for almost nine years plus. And uh, I joined in as a sales head, then took over marketing applications. And I was managing a team of 135 people at Linde. India. And then subsequently in 2019, from Linde, India, I was inducted into the board of directors of Linde, Bangladesh. And uh, from 2020 to 23, I was the managing director of Linde, Bangladesh, which you mentioned. We were doing a business close to around 508, 550 crores of uh, business on the top line with a good, healthy profit margin. It's a listed company on the stock exchange. So overall, it has been a very uh, good journey and it has been a blend of diverse experiences, each contributing to my overall growth along with the company growth and uh, shaping my perspective as, uh, you know, in the industry uh, professional arena, I can say. I also did a lot of, uh, on my career front, apart from engineering, I added a lot of value to myself by doing my management from NMIMS Mumbai. That was as a part of my curriculum. I used to go for my classes and then come and implement the, you know, during my work exposure. And also I'm a certified business coach, uh, business coach, executive coach, and OD coach. So that's something about my career journey, uh, which has been for the last three decades, uh, Sunny. Thank you. Mr. Bhai, thank you for the excellent start to this interview. And I must say your career journey is truly inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny. So continuing our conversation, our viewers would like to know, what do you regard as the biggest professional feat you have ever achieved? And could you give an account of it to our viewers? So, uh, Sunny, like, uh, you know, uh, one thing is actually uh, being a part of this uh, career. There are numerous milestones that come into our way. You know, it's a three decade uh, uh, journey, which has been there. And frankly, whatever my current standing and whatever I have grown into this organization is because of the invaluable contributions of my team and uh, the confidence which has been actually reposed by my senior management from time to time. So apart from the financial targets, which we actually keep seeing from time to time, you know, like uh, we have responsibility on the top line, the bottom line, the metrics, as well as, you know, the profitability of the organization and the well-being of the employees. So those are some things which are a must do, but there are certain areas in my career, the milestones which have been very, uh, touching for myself, you know, so if you ask me about a professional achievement, uh, many of them, which is, you know, we have to do, but uh, if I have to pick up a few of them, I can say that I mentioned to you about my LNT, you know, being a part of the LNT and contributing to the nuclear power corporation during the operation Shakti was a very proud moment. Uh, getting our valves, which were there uh, certified for tough standards that involved connecting the dots, you know, between the various departments and the customer ensuring that we supply on time because when there was an embargo from all across the world and we had to supply something for uh, the country, the nation comes first and that's what we did. Uh, there has been similar experiences with uh, Emerson, but if you ask me off late, the last one in Linde, Bangladesh, uh, that has been a real saga and that, uh, that was the time when I was actually posted in 2020 as a managing director. I had a big saga on the personal front uh, I, it was a tough time. I lost my mother at the onset of COVID. And uh, during this time when the pandemic hit us hard, uh, I had taken charge as a managing director. So we had a 120 tons of oxygen plant, which was there in uh, Bangladesh. And the demand was actually increasing. You know that during the uh, COVID situation, uh, the oxygen requirements were going up day by day and then the patients were there. And Lindy is into the field of gases. So the whole prerogative and, uh, you know, the expectations from the country was very high on uh, us because we were the leading suppliers of oxygen within the country. Bangladesh is a smaller country as compared to India, where you have multiple players, but we, this was unanticipated. So that was a major uh, 
we were the go-to guys, you know, during this particular uh, crisis and the whole country was looking at us and here I was on a personal front, having a personal loss on my own front and then I have to do something professionally as a managing director of the organization. Uh, so it was a difficult time, but I can say the challenges were huge. Uh, I had to keep the team together. Uh, we had set up a green corridor between India and Bangladesh and the rest of the world so that we can actually get oxygen across for all the hospitals which were supplying medical oxygen. So you can understand that uh, supplying oxygen was like a fleet of tankers coming in, oxygen tankers. We all have experienced it. And then getting it from across the borders and then getting into the country in a new country, which I have taken charge. So that was a very Herculean task, which uh, you know we were able to get through. And COVID itself saw three phases, you know, the phase one, then we had a Delta variant coming and the third variant, which was earlier last year. So I can say that all throughout this journey, it was a major thing. I had to look at Singapore, Malaysia, all across and try to get those tankers because human life is the most important. And that's a message which I gave to my team. I said that come what may we will ensure that we don't, not a single human life is lost to any of the hospitals that we are actually supplying medical oxygen because of Linde. And we stood to a ground. It was a very proud moment. I can also say on a professional front, when this Delta variant happened in July 2021, that was one of the most dangerous variants of the COVID. And the demand skyrocketed. So you can imagine in the country, uh, you know, it was like 1.7 to two times the requirement of medical oxygen. The plant capacity is around 100 TPD, and then you have something going up to 170, 180 tons per day. It was, you know, difficult. And that was the time when we got a train running in from India to Bangladesh known as Indo-Bangla Oxygen Express. The first time in the history where we have got a train coming across an international border supplying around 4,000 tons plus of medical oxygen within the country. So, you know, uh, overall it was a tough, but I will give my whole credit to the team which worked around the clock for the nation, for the country's better good. Uh, and uh, this also brought a lot of learnings for me, uh, Sunny. I can say that some of the key takeaways for any leadership lessons is that you have to stay strong in tough times. You have to keep your mind above matter. Because any event which happens, it depends upon how you respond to that particular event that can shape your outcome. So that is very important. And I was telling my team that you don't have control on the COVID, but how we can actually adapt and be resilient is what matters the most. And real strength of the team and the leadership comes during the terms of crisis, how you are able to actually manage the situation, whether you're made up of steel or you're made up of plastic that comes up during the, uh, you know, during these times of uh, difficulty. So that was the second uh, takeaway. And then communication is very important. We used to start early morning at four o'clock on WhatsApp and calls and everything and goes up to evening. And you have to have compassion as a leader where you are taking the team along because some of their family members are hospital. Some of them, we also have gone through COVID. So it was very difficult situation. But looking back, if you look into my professional career, which is there, I can say that each member of my team and actually has a tale to share, you know, when they go back home or look back in history, that is one of the things, even for me, it has been one of the biggest uh, lessons, which is there. The government appreciated us, the ministries appreciated, we got off uh, accolades, but I'll say that the prayers of the people during that time, because we not a single life was lost, that was the biggest reward for us. And I can say that that is the biggest achievement for me in my uh, career, uh, Sunny. I think that's what I would like to share. Thank you so much. That sounds exceptional. So building on to that, you have been honored with several accolades. Which of them do you cherish the most and why? So I, I, I just uh, shared with you, like, you know, in terms of uh, my professional uh, background, like uh, all through this journey, there has been a lot of accolades and uh, I have invested a lot of my time on the sales and marketing front. And when we are able to do something for a customer and uh, the amount of win-win uh, situation that happens, it's not the sale or a transaction, but the everlasting relationship that you do, you know, with your customers, like how we have done for the medical and the hospital customers, that has been a great journey and a great learning experience. So I will say that uh, those have been a very good uh, success, but on a personal front, if you ask, uh, in my career, there was, uh, you know, I was uh, judged as the uh, 
Asian Leadership Program as one of the uh, top performers over there, as well as inducted into the India Junior Board in 2009 and 2011. So those two years when I was in Emerson was one of the uh, good uh, moments I cherish because it was a big uh, team of almost 350, 400 people all across the country and then getting selected out of that. And the reason for getting selected is because in 2008, if you recall, we had gone through the Lehman crisis. It was a very difficult time when there was a financial crisis which had come and a lot of businesses were down during that particular period. And then imagine that you have to ensure that uh, your business is doing well. And we started focusing on a completely different area, uh, Sunny. We started focusing on the maintenance replacement opportunities, which is very hard work. You have to do a lot of hard work onto the field, go into the plants, go into offshore platforms, do a survey of all the solenoid valves which was there, and then try to find out cost effective solutions because it is a money crisis in the market and you have to see what is the best cost effective solution that can support the customer and it is a gain for both of us. So you know what, during this particular period from 2008 to 2011, we were able to actually double our business almost by 25% CAGR in three years. So when the original equipment manufacturers were not doing well, we diverted our attention into new markets, new revenue streams, and we were able to actually increase our revenue. And that also gave us a lot of uh, good uh, morale of the salespeople was high. And as a result of which, you know, uh, I was actually uh, uh, selected for the India Junior Board based upon uh, whatever our uh, success has been with our company at Emerson. And uh, I feel proud looking back at it, uh, Sunny, and one of the moments which I cherish till now. Thank you. Amazing, amazing, Mr. Pai. So now that we have discussed your incredible career journey, your professional pursuits, roles, and responsibilities, uh, let's dive into the subject of ESG and corporate governance. So here is my question to you and a very, very obvious one. How and when did you develop an interest in ESG and corporate governance? Oh, okay. So that's a real... Uh... It's a wonderful question that you asked and uh, definitely, uh, you know, this is, uh, I can only say that, uh, Sunny, that during my professional journey, which has been there with uh, all the organizations, esteemed organizations that I named like Hindalco, l &T, Emerson, uh, you know, I had the privilege of being a part of an environment where uh, that gives a lot of focus on the ESG, environmental, social and governance uh, principles. All these organizations are iconic. And uh, while the term ESG has uh, been around for a while, it is only now that it has started gaining a lot of uh, increased awareness. And that also because of, you know, the growing environmental concerns, which has been there. We have also seen uh, there is a lot of uh, increase, even in the G20 summits where, you know, there's a lot of emphasis given about uh, greenhouse gas reductions and climate control, global warming, all those things has really uh, increased a lot of uh, there. But ESG, I can say that, uh, uh, you know, there's also uh, about the corporate governance, uh, also very important at how you're doing your business ethically and also all those things has given a lot of emphasis. And uh, I've, I've been very uh, associated with uh, sustainability, you know, in the organizations that I've worked with, Sustainability has been a very core area. It isn't just a buzzword, I can say, you know, like it's something like a, a new word that we are talking about. It's been a very core value. Any of our organizations, if you see that it has been a core value, which has been embedded in our processes, the way we are actually dealing with our transactions as well as in our operations. To give you an example at Emerson, which has been my the previous assignment where I worked, we used to work on uh, getting solenoid valves, which is going into instrumentation, which were highly energy efficient. We were looking at solenoid valves, which are low power, highly energy efficient. And the whole principle was that when we supply to the customers, the customer doesn't have to you know, keep replacing them because they were meant for a very long cycle. So innovation has gone to such an extent that you don't have to replace, you don't have to keep getting the spare parts and everything. It's a long lasting valve. So if you look at it from a sales perspective, you'll feel that, okay, your revenue is going down, but no, we were trying to work out solutions which were there for a longer duration. And it is a win-win for the customers in that. So we also had an innovation center that was focused on sustainability, bringing out sustainable solutions, which has been there. So, you know, uh, what I'm trying to say is that as an organization, uh, uh, we have been associated even with my last role at Linde, we were looking at making our uh, operational plans 
very green and efficient, energy efficient. Because when you manufacture all the cryogenic gases like oxygen, nitrogen, argon, and all that, power is a major raw source, power. And the whole idea and focus of the team and the management was that how you can try to reduce your power consumption. So we had to look at, uh, you know, reducing your, uh, uh, going for uh, energy efficient motors, energy efficient turbines, going for smart uh, devices, which will be there. And overall, the whole focus was to reduce your dependence on fossil fuels, explore the power of solar, because we used to do at our plants, if you ask me, uh, at, uh, you know, Linde, we, the whole project was how you can actually do away with the normal lighting and go with the solar lighting, simple as that. And then try to quantify it in terms of how much is your GHG reduction? How much is your greenhouse gas reduction? And what is the carbon credits you'll be getting? So those were metrics. Every department, irrespective of the level, right from the top to the bottom, all of us had a complete metrics on productivity and sustainability. So, you know, it has been indoctrinated with us. So one is actually on the sustainability part of it, the social part of it. I will say that people matter. Any organization, whatever be the phase, you know, people matter a lot. And I can say that uh, my experience has been very genuine commitment to the CSR activities and factory compliance on work hours, not only with us as an organization, but also with our supply chain partners and whoever is involved, are they following the labor laws to the T? That's important that, uh, you know, they do it. Provident front, insurance guidelines, are they adhering to that? So those were some of the uh, areas where you had to look. Safety of the employees. Since we at Linde were uh, in the field of gases, so there was a lot of cryogenic tankers moving across. So it was going in tankers and it has its own hazard. So we invested a lot on the technology for the, uh, you know, the tankers which are going. For example, you had six cameras. Then you had certain support mechanisms so that the driver does not sleep onto the wheels. So there is a camera which records and gives you an artificial intelligence based, which actually triggers and sees that he doesn't sleep on the wheels. So, you know, we take a lot of care in terms of safety. Safety never had a budget. And I feel that from a social perspective, touching the lives of the people is most important. Focus on DNI. I had a target even for the diversity and inclusion, where, uh, you know, like we had to, um, I, had, I was very proud to say that not only in your corporate office, we had uh, the, you know, the women's stuff, but also at the operational front, where there was a lot of prejudice earlier that how will a woman come on board? How will she work? But then we had to make those biases. I had to tell my team down the line, that we need to get more women on board. And brilliantly, you know, we have been able to do it even on the shop floor. So I can proudly say that two such areas at Linde, uh, one is actually at Trichy, uh, where it's an all women's plant. The cylinder plant is operated only by ladies. So that gives a lot of, uh, you know, a good thing. And recently one at Hyderabad, I've, uh, that has also been done with the ladies. So, on the social front, you know, these areas are important. And on the governance part of it, I think that needless to say, being in the board of directors and uh, when you interact the board dynamics and the managing director, you have to be, uh, you know, above board and you have to ensure there is a complete transparency and maintain the ethical standards in your business. I can proudly say that 2020 to 2022, when I was uh, all the three consecutive years, we were uh, awarded, we received a lot of accolades from the National Agency in Bangladesh for best strong governance practice, ethical standards, and corporate, uh, you know, uh, how we are doing the protocols. So that has been a great flip of us and as managing director, I can understand that, uh, you know, transparency is important. You need to uh, be very clear how you perform your businesses. You are having a lot of stakeholders in place. Uh, you know, so these were some of the things I believe that uh, throughout my diverse roles and responsibilities, you know, uh, Sunny, I have witnessed firsthand the profound impact that companies can have on the environment as well as it can have on the society. Very important. And uh, this realization has been a driving force for me. And uh, it has actually uh, not only shaped my uh, professional path, uh, but also it has fueled my commitment to, on a personal front, to pursue a career which has been dedicated to sustainable and environment responsible uh, 
you know, corporates which are there. So that's the reason I thought that this has really triggered and taken my interest. And I was going through this particular uh, program on the WDC, and I, then I thought that let me uh, get into it because I have a lot of technical acumen. I have got a good board room, boardroom dynamics, my 30 years of experience, which is there. So why not try getting into this world? And I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, startups which are coming up, the Atma Nirbhar Bharat and Make in India. And I think there's a great potential. So uh, that's the reason actually this triggered my uh, interest. Thank you. So Mr. Pai, as an ESG and corporate governance expert, what values do you bring to the table? Okay. Um, so, uh, Sunny, I think it's just a, a follow-up, I can say, as to the previous. But uh, as I rightly mentioned, that uh, if you look at it from a two areas now, since you asked about expertise and values, and expertise, I can say that uh, my professional journey through my last uh, organizations, almost three decades where it is there, I think I have a considerable uh, you know, breadth and depth of knowledge in terms of the process control in the industrial market, which is it, and which have resonated with the ethos of uh, environment, social, and governance considerations. Very strong. Uh, in terms of uh, sustainability, I can say that there's a lot of areas which, uh, having been a part of the uh, leadership team as well as being from ground up, I've uh, taken myself up. So I think that uh, it's a core value which is indoctrinated within me. And I have a deep understanding of how this business works. So I'll be able to actually integrate whatever I have learned into you know, friendly solutions. Like for example, I explained about uh, the products which are more energy efficient. And then we are also talking about uh, how you can actually do renewable energy. So when you have the technical knowledge and you try to, because at the end of the day, one is actually your uh, criteria for any company wants to do is a profit. So we all have to do profits, but we have to do it responsibility and that's how you can actually integrate with my technical knowledge and the sustainability practices, how you can actually make your organization. So that's one. The second part is operational excellence it is one area where uh, over the last few years and especially at Linde, I had the exposure of working, uh, you know, the operations had the, uh, the control of that, at least the uh, insight and management. So I think there's a lot of things in terms of Lean Six Sigma, and uh, I can say that this expertise and uh, understanding will give an idea about how to do your uh, operation lean and in a much better way and efficient manner. So because all throughout you have to see how you can actually reduce your wastage and uh, you have to reduce your bottlenecks and try to see how you can make it much better. And uh, in terms of the social responsibility, I believe that uh, we are all committed. I have spirited a lot of uh, things on the CSR front uh, you know, collaborating with the supply chain partners and trying to see that uh, there is ensuring the compliance with the labor standards. That gives a lot of uh, importance. I think uh, my uh, knowledge over the last uh, three decades will come into handy on that. And I think risk mitigation is also important. It is not only being a reactive approach. We have carried out a lot of risk management workshops. So I think Spearing those risk management workshops will give us a proactive way in actually finding out what are the potential pitfalls that could be there in our journey. What could be the ESG related risks which can be there? And then uh, as an organization, what you can do, because you can't replace a complete, uh, uh, you know, suppose you're not, uh, you don't have to invest every time in capital. You can sometimes find out some cost effective measures which are very resilient and that can be good enough. So you have to develop a resilient uh, strategies for that. And I think uh, communication and uh, overall uh, through my organization that has been good and I can uh, communicate and articulate well down the line. So those are some things on the expertise part of it. Values has been in terms of ethics and uh, integrity all through the organizations have been uh, demonstrated uh, to ethical decision making and uh, that has been a profound impact. Stakeholder engagement, legal laws, so all those things, you know, I can uh, do well. But it is not about you driving it alone. I think uh, the whole idea is getting your team alone. What is your long-term vision, which you have for the uh, company and how you want to take it forward. So I think I'll be able to do that where whatever the ethical considerations are there, how does it impact the long-term vision of the company? And are we on the right path? Are we resonating in the right direction? That's something which is important for the success of the organization. And empowering the employees, it's not only me or anyone, only the top management doing, but empowering. And that's what my whole strength in my career, Sunny, has been with my team. 
So it's not only, uh, you know, me doing it alone, but it has also been with the team. And uh, that's what I would say. Uh, in essence, I will say that my long-standing industry experience uh, coupled with my uh, business coaching skills, which has been their leadership skills, and it positions me in the right manner to actually take up all these managements and give a hand holding to them in the right direction so that, you know, they can start seamlessly integrating sustainability into operations and uh, governance principles is important. So that's it. Uh, I can say that how I can actually contribute to the organizations and the community at large with my uh, proven, uh, you know, whatever the knowledge and experience I've gained over the years. Thank you, Sunny. Thanks. That's what I can say about it. Amazing. So moving forward, let's discuss technology and its impact on a professional landscape. So here is my question to you. What are some of the most remarkable changes you have seen in your field with changes in technology as part A? And what changes do you expect to see with the advent of technology like IoT, AI, ML, blockchain, big data, web 3.0, etc.? Oh, so uh, that's a very uh, insightful question, uh, Sunny. Um, so, you know, uh, technology, I can say that uh, the world is continuously evolving. The technological landscape has indeed transformed our industry like anything, you know. So uh, we have seen that, we are experiencing that uh, technology while it is also disrupting our lives. Uh, and you have to learn, we are talking about AI, chat GPT, I need not have to say, but if we don't maintain pace with technology, then technology will outpace us. As simple as that. So either you catch up or you get burnt out. You know, that's what was happening. And there's no way you can uh, actually say, that, you know, I'm from the old school and all. No, no, it doesn't work. Uh, we have to be technologically uh, savvy. That's not one. You have to be always in connect with your Zen Z. I'll say that, you know, maybe I'm from the Gen X, but we have to be always with the latest generation, see what's happening. How are they actually trying to make use of the technology, learn that, you know, the things which are there. So the world is getting closer and we have started seeing the impact of it. I can say that especially during COVID, uh, what used to feel like, you know, I used to be into the field of sales and then we used to go across meeting our customers face-to-face, -face, meeting our team face-to-face. -face. But when those things became a challenge, we saw that how organizations started working on the virtual platform and decisions were being taken. You can see that decisions were being taken and uh, that also has worked. So right now, okay, we are back to our workplace, but that has given us an understanding that in terms of any contingency, you can anytime go into the virtual environment and still take your decisions and organizations can continue and perform. So it has completely been a disruptor, I can say. And uh, if you look at it uh, from our organization or my industry experience, uh, which has been there, all these terminologies that you mentioned, for example, the IoT, IoT at the plant level is something which I have seen uh, very closely where, you know, my air separation plants, which used to be there, they were having a complete connectivity, like all across the country and the whole cluster, we are all connected. We are all connected to a uh, central nodal point and you're able to actually see what is your real time performance. You're able to do which motor is working efficiently. So if there's a, uh, if the harmon the hysteresis of the motor goes in for a slight variation, you are able to understand that this motor is not behaving the right way. And what is it that we need to take? So we have been able to implement a lot of areas, uh, Sunny, actually at uh, my, in Bangladesh, at our electrode plant, where some of the operations which were being done, we started getting it, uh, getting a real time feedback by doing small modifications. So gone are the days when you say that, you know, you used to have a lot of capexes needed. No, you can do even with the slightest amount of uh, knowledge. And what you need to do is actually how you are able to connect it properly. So we had smart uh, systems in which can give you the real time dashboard, productivity per uh, work, uh, you know, work area, workmen, how much who is the most productive of all. You can get real time dashboards. So that is something which is there in terms of uh, the IoT at plant level. You are able to do that with a lot of sensors. We are able to do it. Then data insights. So data insights, I will say that uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, which is there, the amount of data that is the machines and the motors, whatever is of the turbine is operating, you get a lot of information. And that data, uh, the big data analysis, that helps to understand 
what is the right mix of the product that can operate my plant properly? Matlab, if my plant is operating oxygen, nitrogen, and argon, so if I do a higher amount of nitrogen and oxygen, that can be more energy efficient and it can give the right mix to the market. So, you know, you can do these combinations uh, through AI Insight. And AI Insight will also, uh, you know, it can give you a great insight into your customer centric. So, because we are all customer centric. All organizations, we have to be focused on the customer. So from this data mining and data insight, you're able to understand that what is the customer's uh, offtake? How much is, uh, you know, when is he going to pick up more? Which, what is his seasonal cycle? So you're able to actually plan before he comes to you with his order. You can say that's a, this is your requirement. We have seen how Swiggy and Zomato are able to read our minds, right? So in similar part of it, you can also have... Uh, this uh, coming up, uh, Sunny, like, uh, you know, we are able to do that data insights. Then the other thing is personalized uh, response going to the customers, product recommendations going from time to time. We have, we have done that. And uh, you are also able to have predictive analysis. The predictive analysis, because of this, you are able to understand which machine is not doing well. I talked about it. Not only this, we are also able to help our customers because if your customer is having... A uh, same amount of inventory, you can also tell him that this is the inventory, it is reaching the threshold level you need to order, or we will send up a vehicle from here. So you are actually one step forward in a very proactive way to your customer. And then you are trying to give him with data insights and predictive analysis. Then augmented reality, for example, augmented reality, virtual reality, and you know this uh, metaverse we are talking about. We have implemented that to just share with you if any of our customers want to have a plant installed, the conventional way would have been that, okay, sir, you please come to our uh, plant. I will show you around and how the plant is working. And you know you have to make arrangements for his visit or you have to go there. But right now with the virtual reality, he can put on the VR glasses and you can take him a virtual walk through your plant. That if so, if this is your plant, how it is going to come and this is the virtual reality, how you will be navigating yourself. So you're giving a real-time immersive experience to your customer. Augmented reality, for example, this is the cylinders or any of my products which is going to fit into your uh, shop floor premises. You look into your mobile app and show him that this is the place where your cylinder is fitting without physically transporting and giving it across. So, you know, uh, we are implementing it with all those things has been integrated. And I see that there's a lot of technological, there's a paradigm shift which is actually happening. And that also a tectonic shift which is happening in terms of uh, the integration. And I think that in short, uh, you know, even blockchains are also getting, there's a great impetus in our country uh, on account of all this Atman Nirbhar Bharat. And we are seeing there's a lot of trust which is happening. But all said and done, uh, technology, uh, if you're asking me, well, where the future is, that's the second part of your question. Definitely, it is here to stay. We all have to uh, learn it, but don't allow it to become your master. That's what I will say, because there are certain areas where the human touch is involved, Sunny. Hum logon ko jo empathy hai, human touch is involved. Those type of things, automation can definitely give, but maintaining a human touch is difficult. Like what we are able to speak and what we are able to respond is important. You can't have, uh, while well, you can have an HR onboarding program through chatbots and virtual assistant, like anybody joining onto the organization and you can have a chatbots and knowledge portals and all that, but you cannot have exit interviews through chatbots. You cannot have that. You need to have a human touch. You need to have a performance appraisal, which is there. So human connection is extremely important from time to time because we are humans at the end of it. We can't be replaced by uh, AI, some jobs, mundane jobs, repetitive jobs, that will keep going, continue. You know, that can get repeat, that can get converted through robotics, but that's important. The second thing is you have to be very careful about the data privacy and all, both important. Uh, that, uh, that's why cybersecurity is also going to be extremely important. So in essence, I will say that to sum it up, while uh, embracing this technological uh, advances gives us great benefits and all, uh, but we have to mitigate the potential uh, pitfalls which can happen and uh, you need to have all the human centric values which are there into consideration. I hope that answers your question, Sunny. Sipai, thank you for sharing such amazing insights into this subject. So this brings us to the last question of the session. We are building a community of industry magnets. 
the move is meant for cross pollination of knowledge and building a knowledge sharing community of corporate giants and industry experts so what are your thoughts about these initiatives taken by mr zishan pathan mr hevel mehta and the team of world development corporation uh, thank you thank you i think uh, this should have been the uh, first question uh, you know sunny i, I can say that uh, you know the way i have given you my journey how i came across into the esg curriculum and then uh, getting in, into that uh, the whole idea i'm really impressed with this uh, community amazing community of industry magnates and the whole initiative that has been actually taken great bringing together big names in the industry i am uh, excellent you know and all the experts who are there on one platform and uh, kudos to uh, mr zishan patan and uh, mr hevel uh, mehta and the whole uh, world development uh, corporation team for leading this cool initiative you know it's not just a smart move i will say but uh, it's a big step towards sharing the knowledge amongst top corporate leaders and industry experts in the right direction so wdc is doing an awesome job i will say that uh, the online sessions what we had was great the whole idea about this modules uh on the corporate governance the esg and all that has been wonderfully done it's really crafted well and uh, i love the chance you know when we had the uh, sessions with uh, uh you know chakravyu there were some sessions from js and also wonderful sessions absolutely wonderful and the whole idea is these are case studies nothing like black and white you also have those gray areas you know and that is when you have a complete discussion with your other fellow colleagues and you get to know a different views you know different views on the same issue it's not that you know my rule or my highway you come to know different perspectives because of the depth and breadth of the knowledge of all my uh, counterparts and huge thanks to zishan and hevel for uh, starting this at a time you know that there's a big shortage we know that there's a shortage of independent directors in this industry and i think uh, it has come at the right time and i have been very uh, fortunate to be at the right time in the right place uh, and talking about esg i think that uh, independent directors have a strong role to to play you know very vital so by joining this forces we are not only making corporate governance better but also playing a key part for the sustainability initiatives forward you know so this program is good and i'm sure that with many startups which are coming up we have seen about i talked about atmanirbhar bharat and make in india and a lot of uh, new organizations are coming up and so also there's going to be a lot of uh, boardroom dynamics which i believe is going to be there and the scope of independent directors has become even more accountable it's not just a ornamental position in the boardroom it has become more accountable accountability is very high so being a part of the wdc is a must because it gives a great chance to connect learn keep upgrading your skills and contribute to making sure that these boards run responsibility and corporate governance is top notch in wherever whichever the organizations we are uh, being uh, going as independent director so this program has been a game changer uh, sunny to sum it up and uh, i hope that we will be gaining great uh, network making lot of friends with the uh, industry magnets and also uh, get valuable insights as we progress through the way so uh, i can say that uh, so cheers uh, to you all and it's a great initiative thank you thank you so much on that uh, sunny great it was fantastic conversing with you and i'm confident that your insights will inspire future leaders thank you mr sujith for joining us today wish you the best for your future endeavors moreover trust that this initiative by directors institute has unquestionably expanded the participants understanding and enriched their minds thank you so much sunny and thanks to again to the wdc and industry magnets for uh, this wonderful uh, session look forward again thank you very much bye bye thank you have a nice day have a nice day